Lord, make me an instrument. Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands to your knees. One more time, Lord, make me, Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands to your name, Lord, make me. We are talking about ruling and reigning from your personal altar. Hold it then, Tate Peche, don't go yet. And we are focusing on how to build a strong personal altar. Under the subtitle, The Sacrifices of the New Testament Priest. Because the power of the altar is sacrifice. The voice of the altar, whether positive or negative, is sacrifice. The altar, any altar is as powerful as the sacrifice on it and any believer is as, as powerful as their personal altar. But any altar is as powerful as the sacrifice on it. Without sacrifice, altars are powerless. So the power of any altar is sacrifice. But you see, you and I are New Testament priests. And as New Testament priests, we do not offer animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices were declared obsolete in the Old Testament. They ended when Jesus died on the cross. Because those animal sacrifices were a type, they were a shadow of Jesus who was going to come and become the ultimate sacrifice. They were pointing out to Christ. And when Jesus came and he died on the cross, all the sacrifices offered by the Old Testament priests in the temple were no longer necessary because Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice. The cross was the altar upon which Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, was offered for the redemption of humanity. Therefore, the animal sacrifices were no longer necessary. In Hebrews 9 verse 12, the Bible says, With his own blood, not the blood of bulls and goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Hebrews 9 12 in the New Living Translation. So there's no longer need for animal sacrifices because Christ offered himself once and for all for the sins of God's people. Hebrews 7 27 says, unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day, but Jesus did this once and for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for people's sins. And in Hebrews 10 verse 14, the Bible says, with one sacrifice, then he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. And in John 1 35, when John saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, animal sacrifices have been declared obsolete. So when we talk about the fact now that the, the priests in the Old Testament offered animal sacrifices, we as priests in the New Testament, priesthood is still valid. We are priests after the order of Melchizedek, not after the Aaronic priesthood. As priests, we still offer sacrifices, but we offer spiritual sacrifices. 1 Peter 2 verse 5, I'm just doing a brief recap. It says, you also, as living stones, are being built up 
a, a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Apostle Peter writes of the church as being a holy priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices. So as New Testament priests, therefore, we offer spiritual sacrifices. The priesthood is still valid. The Bible talks about the priesthood of all believers in the new covenant. But it's the type of sacrifice that has changed. We don't offer the bulls, the goats, the animals. We offer spiritual sacrifices. So there are several new sacrifices that a New Testament priest is to offer on the altar. Remember, three things are inseparably connected. The priest, the altar, and the sacrifice. You cannot be a priest without an altar, and there can be no altar without the priesthood. And each time you talk about sacrifice, it is not offered anywhere. It is offered on the altar. So these three things are inseparably connected. And so in the New Testament, since the priesthood is still valid, we need to find out what kind of sacrifices the New Testament priesthood is to offer. And the Bible tells us it's spiritual sacrifices. In order, therefore, to have a strong personal altar, as a New Testament priest, you need to offer spiritual sacrifices. The question is, what are those spiritual sacrifices? And we said, number one, the first sacrifice you offer on the altar is yourself offering ourselves unto God offering ourselves unto God this is the first sacrifice on the altar the greatest sacrifice you can offer on the altar is yourself Romans 12 verse 1 Paul says I beseech you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly pleasing to God which is your reasonable service now I shared something I, I spoke to us about this point last Sunday but when I went back to study I realized that there are some key words that I need to explain so that this can become very clear now you notice when I say we offer ourselves on the altar I'm not, lit, I'm not talking about literally killing yourself and then going into a structure somewhere and say, I offer myself. This is spiritually speaking. Remember, as New Testament priests, we offer spiritual sacrifices. This is something you do, you, you do consciously, but this is something that works in the realms of the spirit. This is the choice you make, the decision you make to offer yourself as a sacrifice on the altar. Now let's unpack it. Paul's admonition to the believers in Rome was to sacrifice themselves to God, not as a sacrifice on the altar as the Mosaic law required, the sacrifice of animals, but as a living sacrifice. Remember, in the old covenant a sacrifice that was offered in the form of a dead animal of course the animal had to be killed first and be put on the altar so in the old covenant it was a dead sacrifice but here the Bible says we need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice that's what I want to explain a living sacrifice now before I explain that what is a sacrifice a sacrifice is something of value that is given up completely to God as an act of worship something of value that is given up to God as an act of worship it could be money it could be material possessions or it could be your life And it could be my life that's what sacrifice is let's take it any further the dictionary defines sacrifice as anything consecrated and offered to God that word consecrated 
from where we get the word consecration something set apart set aside unto God to be used into glorifying God to be used in the worship of God sacrifice the Bible says offer your body as a living sacrifice the first sacrifice we offer as New Testament priests on the altar is ourselves giving a sacrifice involves permanently giving something that has value to the giver and therefore involves giving up something that most people would rather keep for themselves a sacrifice is given by a lesser being that is man to a greater being that is God as a form of submission and worship as believers then how do we consecrate and offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice Paul the apostles beseeches the church in Rome to present your bodies as a living sacrifice now what does the word present mean in that passage of scripture Remember, the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language and the New Testament was written in the Greek and the Aramaic language. And so sometimes, to find out the truth of the text, to get the real meaning of the text, you have to go to the original language with which the Bible was written. Because sometimes, when the translators were translating from the original language to the English language, you lose the meaning. Now, let's look at the word present. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does the word present mean in the original language? The word present comes from the Greek word, the Greek word parestimai, which is a compound of the words para and istimai. It means out of two words. The prefix para means alongside, and the word istimai means to place. When these two words are, are, are compounded together, the new word meaning, or the word present means to place besides, to place at one's disposal, to surrender, to offer, as to offer a sacrifice to God, or to present, as to present a special offering to God. Paul pleaded with the believers in Rome to present your bodies. In other words, he's saying, place your body besides on the altar. Place it at one's disposal, at God's disposal. Surrender it. Offer it as a sacrifice to God. But remember, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was dead. But you and I offer it as a living sacrifice. It's not about killing yourself physically. It's about dying to self. It's about living a life of surrender. It is about living a life of consecration. In other words, when I surrender myself on the altar, I am presenting my life, my body, as a living sacrifice. It's a form of worship. Spiritually speaking, something happens. What do I mean when I surrender my life as a sacrifice? That simply means I die to self. That simply means my whole life, spirit, soul, and body, and everything that I have is surrendered. It is at God's disposal. It is surrendered to be used to worship the Lord. That simply means my lifestyle must bring glory to God. That's what the Bible says in the book of Matthew, when the Bible says, let your light shine before men, so that men may glorify your Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? That simply means that if I live according to the word of God as a believer, my life becomes a form of worship that causes even the unsaved people to glorify God. But if I do wrong, I bring the name of the Lord into disrepute. So, when you present your body as a living sacrifice unto God, it simply means dying to self. Living a life that glorifies God. Living a life of worship to God. A consecrated life. Okay. Lord, make me 
an instrument an instrument of worship I lift up my hands to your name Lord make me an instrument come on Kaya an instrument of worship I lift up my hands to your name no Lord make me an instrument where does this comes from it's from the same text Romans 12 it's amplifying it look at Romans chapter 6 somebody find me Muruti Mahat, find me Romans chapter 6 okay pastor when you have the Bible there Romans chapter 6 come 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 and read it for us Romans chapter 6 and I want you to read verses 12 Read verse 12 and 13. Romans chapter 12, chapter 6 from verse 12. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its last. Do not present member, your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Present your members to God. What does that mean? The members is talking about every part of your body. It says do not use the members of your body as instruments to sin. That simply means you and I should not use the members of our physical body or our physical bodies rather as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather we should present our bodies as instruments of righteousness. How do you present that? You present it on the altar. This is what Paul is saying when he says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That simply means you present your whole being on the altar to use the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. So that's why we are singing this in song. Lord make me instrument an instrument of worship I lift up remember I want some spicy hands to your name Lord make me an instrument an instrument of worship symphony Lord make me a symphony a symphony of worship I lift up my hands to your name Lord make me a symphony symphony of worship I lift up my hands to you come on sing it from your heart Lord make me an instrument Lord make me an instrument an instrument an instrument of worship I lift up I lift up my hands
last time, Lord, make me. Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands to your name. Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of words. I lift up my hands to your name. Lift up my hands to you. I lift up my hands to your name. I lift up my hands. this song says Lord make me an instrument of worship make me my spirit my soul my body make me an instrument of worship let my hands my feet everything everything about me let it be an instrument of worship now when does that happen that happens when we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God thank you guys it happens when we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. There are some things that I couldn't, I didn't explain and when I read the text I realized no, 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 I need to make these things clear. Now, so as a, as a priest, the greatest gift or sacrifice you can offer to God on your personal altar is yourself first. Before any other sacrifice. I need to offer myself. You, you want to have a powerful altar? You want to operate from a powerful altar? The first sacrifice to offer on the altar is yourself. Amen. It's myself. Now, Paul pleaded with the believers in Rome to present your bodies. This does not refer merely to the external material part of the believer, but to the whole person. The totality of the individual. The term speaks of cost, for feature and loss. The relinquishing of one's total self. And encourages a complete surrender with nothing held back. Clearly Paul had one of the objectives in mind. To convey the concept of becoming a sacrifice. That's what it means to present your body as a living sacrifice. The priest must first of all lay his life on the altar and offer it as a spiritual sacrifice unto God. Like with the burnt offering in the Old Testament, a Christian offers his entire being, spirit, soul, and body to the Lord. Now, this speaks of a whole life worship. It speaks of a lifestyle of worship. When the worshiper in the Old Testament took his sacrificial lamb to the temple to offer it to the Lord God. He presented it, it in, in its entirety. Full. He, he presented the whole of it. He surrendered all claims to the animal. It was no longer his to claim or use in any manner. So the Apostle Paul had this idea clearly in mind. The believer in Christ is to devote himself to God as if he no longer had any claim on himself. That's what it means to present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. You no longer have claims on yourself. I told you last Sunday that we have given our lives to Christ. How many of you have given your life to Christ? If you have given your life to Christ, then you no longer have a life. Paul says I've been crucified with Christ Galatians 2 20 nevertheless I live and the life that I live I live by faith in the Son of God you have given away your life and the, the proof that you and I have given away our lives is not to make any claims 
is to live a surrendered life. Because if you and I are still controlling our lives, then it means that we have not surrendered. We are not living a surrendered life. So it is on the altar where we live a surrendered life. It is by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice on the altar where we live a surrendered life. We no longer control our lives. Now, the Apostle Paul had this idea in mind. The believer in Christ is to devote himself. That is a holy sacrifice. And that is the sacrifice he will use for his glory alone. The Bible says it is pleasing, acceptable to God. It is a sacrifice in which God delights. Can somebody say amen? That is the sacrifice. It is, the Bible says it is a spiritual, reasonable, worshipful service consecrated to God that is accepted to God. It includes the whole person. Mind, spirit, and body. Spirit, soul, and body, rather. It is personal, rational, conscious, intellectual devotion to the service of our Lord. It is not mechanical like animal that cannot make a decision about its destiny. Remember, uh, in animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, the animal did not make a choice. The animal had no choice. It was the owner of the animal who will choose it as a sacrifice and kill it and he put it on the altar. But with you and I, as sacrifices on the altar, it's different. We, you, you don't get an animal, you put yourself there. And you choose, you make a decision, you choose to be a sacrifice. So the believer as a priest must present on the altar their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We need to understand that true worship touches each and every area of our lives. We are to honor and adore God in everything. Now, here's another thing that I want to explain before I move on to another point. What does living sacrifice mean? This is one thing I didn't explain last Sunday. Sometimes we just represent your bodies as a living sacrifice and we pass by. Remember, the Old Testament sacrifice was killed. They would kill it before they offer it. But the Bible says we need to present ourselves as living sacrifices. It is of this sacrifice is that it is living. We present ourselves as a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, an animal sacrifice will be offered upon the altar because the animal was dead. It could, not, it, it could only be presented to the Lord once as a sacrificial offering. Now, listen to me very carefully. In the Old Testament, because the animal was dead, it could only be sacrificed once. If you were to offer another sacrifice, you needed to bring another dead animal. Why? Because the one you offered before, it was dead. So you offered it once. So dead sacrifices are offered once. But the Bible says we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Not as dead sacrifices. You see, if you say, no, I've offered myself as a, as a sacrifice to God. I, I, I don't need to offer myself anymore. Those are dead sacrifices. But remember, you and I are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. In the New Testament, we are urged to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. We are to present our bodies living as opposed to slain sacrifices. Now, what are the implications of this? A living sacrifice is not a one-time offering, never to be repeated. Rather, it is to be ongoing in as much as it continually lives. This implies that we must live in a continual state of surrender and consecration. We are to offer our, our bodies as a living sacrifice. The implication is that this is something we need to do on a regular basis. This is not something you just do it once and say, yeah, I have presented my body as a living sacrifice. This is something you do on a regular basis. This is something you do from time to time. This is something you need to do every day. Paul the Apostle say, I die daily. This is something you do because there is a human tendency. There is the flesh, our unregenerate human nature. The nature that is hostile to God. 
That is why we need to live a crucified life. And how do you crucify the flesh? You crucify it by dying daily. How do you die daily? By carrying the cross. What is the cross? The cross is the altar where you, you, you crucify self. And in this instance, your personal altar is a place where you die daily. So when you wake up in the morning and you say, Father, I present my body as a living sacrifice unto you. I present my spirit, soul, and body. I present every fiber of my being. I present everything that I own as an act of worship before you. I die to self. I die to my own will. I die to my own choices. I die to my own desires. Only your will be done in my life today and not my own will. Use these hands to your glory. May they be used as instruments of righteousness. I surrender my whole being to be used as instruments of righteousness and not as instruments of unrighteousness. May my life bring worship to you. You know, every day I lay down on the altar. Today, it is your will and not my will. As I leave my house to go to work, to go to school, it is your will and not my will. As I go to face the world there, let my life be an instrument of worship. Let men and women glorify God through my life. That is presenting your body as a living sacrifice. This is something we do on an ongoing basis as a living sacrifice. It's not something you just do once. Paul says, I die daily. I die daily. Why? Because, is he talking about physical death? No. He's talking about dying to the flesh. He's talking about dying to self. He's talking to, about dying, you know, because self is that unregenerate human nature that rears its ugly head from time to time. You see, Jesus is Lord of our lives and we need to affirm his lordship in our lives on a daily basis. Because you see, we are free moral agents. We are not created robots. We have been given the power to choose and to make choices. And so, on a daily basis, you and I need to make a choice to serve him. A choice to worship him. A choice to do his will. Can somebody say amen? Our commitment may begin with a momentous once and for all decision, but it must be followed with a daily decision to keep on surrendering ourselves to the Lord. Yes, you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ that day when you got born again. But that should not be the end of it. After that, you need to surrender yourself as a living sacrifice on the altar, on a daily basis, on a continual basis. Can somebody say amen? Thus, we must see every day of our lives as another day, another opportunity to yield our lives to God. As Paul said in Romans 6, 18, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And Paul said, I die daily. And Paul also says, you need to, you know, yield your members. You need to yield yourself. And in Romans 6, 19, he some he summed them to yield their members. Here he pleaded with them to present your bodies in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. In Romans chapter 6 verse 19, he, he, he pleaded with them, uh, to, he summoned them to yield their members. So yield your members in Romans 6 19. And Romans chapter 12 verse 1, present your bodies. This does not merely refer to external material part of the believer, but to the whole person, to the totality of the individual. So, the first sacrifice we offer on the cross, I mean on the altar, is ourselves. So the question is, do you live, are you living a surrendered life? Am I living a surrendered life? So if you and I want to have a powerful altar, the most powerful sacrifice is self before any other sacrifice. We present ourselves. Sacrifice number two, we said prayer. Prayer is incense. Prayer is like incense that ascends to God. Prayer ascends to God as incense. We looked at several scriptures, Revelations 8 verses 3 to, 8, 3 to 5, and we looked at 2 Chronicles 30 verse 27, when we pray, prayer ascends to heaven. We looked at Psalm 141 verses 1 and 2, prayer 
like incense ascends to heaven. We looked at Revelations 5, 7 through to 8. You can get the CD. We, we, we looked at Acts 10 verse 4. In fact, I should have moved on, but I needed to go back to that first part. Now let's look at the third sacrifice we need to offer on the altar. I, I, I feel that we need to work on bringing this series to an end within the next two Sundays. God willing. The third sacrifice is giving financial gifts. Giving financial gifts to others or giving financial gifts to further the preaching of the gospel. You want to have a powerful altar. Be a giver. You want to know one of the sacrifices you are to offer on the altar as a priest? It is your giving. It is your finances. Now let's look at it in the Bible. You see, Barcelona, giving is a form of worship. Generous giving for the expansion of the kingdom of God and giving to others is another New Testament sacrifice. Money is one of the sacrifices we offer upon the altar. Now how can something as money be a spiritual sacrifice? It is because when you give your money, it's not only money or your material possessions, anything you give, whatever you give to God, it ascends unto him as a sacrifice upon the altar. That is why before you bring your tithe to the storehouse on your offering, as a believer who has an altar, you need to offer it in your altar at home. You need to put it on the altar before God. Present it before God. Give it to the Lord on the altar and then bring it to the main altar here. Giving is a form of worship. Our giving to God, whether we give for the furtherance of the gospel, whether we give to the poor, whether we give to our pastor, any form of giving is sacrifice and it is an act of worship to God. In other words, whatever you give in the realms of the spirit ascends to heaven as a sweet smelling aroma if it is given out of the right motive from the right heart because there's what we call acceptable sacrifices in the Bible and unacceptable sacrifices giving is a form of worship worship even in the Old Testament was connected with giving the first occurrence of the word worship in the Old Testament involved giving. In Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says, Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. That word offering is the Hebrew word mina, M-I-N-H-A. It means a gift to pay homage to a superior being. What does it mean to pay homage? To pay homage is to worship. And we know that God accepts Abel's sacrifice or offering and he did not accept Cain's offering. So what do we see? We see that the offering that is offered on the altar is either accepted by God or rejected by God. Why? Because giving is a form of worship. Whether you give in the church or whether you give outside of the church, whether you give for charity, whether it is alms giving, any form of giving is an act of worship. So when you give your tithe here in the church, when you give your offerings here in the church, it does not just end in the bank account of the church. If you gave it out of a good heart, with a good motive, it ascends to heaven as an act of worship. It is credited into your heavenly account. Okay. Let me give you some scriptures. 
in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 18. This is Paul the apostle talking to the church in Philippi. He says, I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. An acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The Philippian believers gave to Paul. They sent an offering to the man of God, Paul. They partnered with Paul for 20 years, the Philippian church did. They partnered with him by supporting him financially. And so here Paul has received the offerings. And then he says, I have received everything in full. And have abundance. It is Paul who enjoyed the offerings. It is Paul who ate. He says, I am amply supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. But notice he says, he says, a fragrant aroma. An acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God. Paul says, you have given me, you have blessed me, I've enjoyed it. But your acts of generosity towards me did not just end with me enjoying. Your giving has also ascended to God as a form of worship. You see, when you give in church, or when you give outside of church, the principle of giving in general, it benefits you. It's an act of worship. Our giving to God's servant goes up to him as an incense of sweet smell. It is a spiritual service in obedience to God's word. And this understanding should change our attitude about giving to those who labor in the gospel. So the offering given, given by the Philippians to Paul's ministry ascended to God as a sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma acceptable to him. Now this happens spiritually. Paul enjoyed the gifts, but in the realms of the spirit, the offering ascended to heaven as a form of worship, as a sweet smelling aroma. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 8. Now it's talking about the tithe. You know, many debates, it's tithing, an Old Testament concept that has no, no relevance in the New Testament and all the rest of it. You know, people try to discredit tithing. But tithing was neither a product of the law. Tithing started before the law. It continued during the law and also after the law. I'm not talking about tithing, but I just want to show you that when you give or when you pay your tithe, it's an act of worship. You're offering ascents. Your tithe ascends to heaven. Hebrews 7 verse 8. Here, that is here on earth, mortal men receive tithes. But there he receives them of whom, of whom it is witness that he lives. Here on earth, mortal men, that is you, us. I'm a mortal man. I represent God. I'm a mortal man. Here on earth, I receive the tithe on behalf of Jesus, our high priest. But the Bible says, here mortal man receives the tithe, but there he receives them. There, where? At the right hand of the Father, where Jesus is. He receives them. Is Hebrews in the New Testament? Is the book of Hebrews in the New Testament? So here on earth, mortal men like you, like me, I receive the tithe on behalf of him, but when I receive the tithe, I present it to him, and there he receives it. So that simply means it doesn't just end in the bank account of the church. How does he receive it as we present it to him? It ascends to heaven in the realms of the spirit as a form of worship from the altar. So giving and tithing 
is one of the sacrifices you offer on the altar. You will never see a stingy believer with a powerful altar. Never. A stingy believer will never operate from a powerful altar. And remember, these sacrifices are all important. None is more important than the other. You can offer some and not offer others. If you want to operate from a powerful altar. When we tithe, our tithe ascends to heaven and God receives it as a sweet smelling aroma. So, when you give a gift, when you give, when you give, when you give, whether you give to a person, whether you give to the church, whether you give to the poor, your offering does not end up with the person you gave. It ascends to heaven. Let me show you again Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 through to 25. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you bring your gift to the altar, notice the connection between your gift and the altar. Look at the, the connection between the gift and the altar. When you bring your gift on the altar, why are you bringing your gift on the altar? Because you are going to worship. Why are you bringing your gift on the altar? Because it is a sacrifice you are going to give. Your offering is a sacrifice. It is in the place of an altar where we dedicate ourselves, where we sacrifice, where we worship God. It's a place of oath taking. It's a place of covenant making. It's a place of dedication. It is a place of worship. So, before you bring your offering to the house of the Lord, go into your personal altar. Your personal altar is a place where you connect with God. Put your, your offering on the altar. Present it to God. Give it to God. Now, does it mean that we, you can't do that in church? You can do it in church, but use that as standard practice. When we, when we, after you have given the offerings, when we raise up and we pray for them, we are not just doing that as part of the religious gymnastics. It is a spiritual principle. We are presenting these gifts to God as an act of worship. You have given money. Listen to me. God in heaven does not need a thousand rand. Heaven is not a bonded place. God does not buy food. I'm saying this reverently. God does not need our money there. We need money here. But we can worship him with our substance. So the money will be used here on earth. But we worship him with our material possessions. So giving is one of the sacrifices you offer on the altar. Number one, you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Number two, prayer. It's important. Number three, giving. You give financially and materially. Any form of giving for the extension of the kingdom of God, that is God's work, whether you give to your pastor, whether you give to the poor, any form of giving, um, you are giving as unto the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Paul encourages the sacrifice of generosity in contributing to the needs of others. We are to share with God's people who are in need. Doing good and sharing with others are considered sacrifices that please God. Hebrews 13 verse 16. See, I like it because I'm not telling you stories. I'm showing you from the Bible. Hebrews 13, 16. But do not forget to do good, to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So doing good to others and sharing with others is considered a sacrifice. When you give somebody a lift, is that doing good? Is that doing good, Bazalwan? When you share a meal with somebody, is that doing good? When you help your brother uh, with taxi money, is that doing good? The Bible says with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You see, let me say this to you. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's not a Sunday life. It's not a once-off. It's not a once-a-week life, you know, life. It's not an event. It is a lifestyle. So, you are not a Christian only on Sunday. 
So even outside of the four walls of the church building, you are a child of God. So when you do good to others, you are still worshipping God. When you bless others, when you are kind to others, when you help the poor, when you help the needy, Hello? When you share your meal, whether the people are saved or not saved, that's not the issue. The issue is you are demonstrating the love of God. You become the extension of God's love. The Bible says with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So doing good is considered a sacrifice that you are offering on your altar. The Bible here describes acceptable worship as giving to those who are in need. That glorifies God because we do, when we do so, we are demonstrating his life. My time, please. Oh, okay. Acts 10 verse 4. Acts 10 verse 4. This is talking about Cornelius. It says, and when he, that is Cornelius, had observed him, he was afraid. And said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms or your giving or your gifts have come up for a memorial before God. Pastor Quena, get me Psalm 20. Psalm 20. We're going to read verses 1 to 4. Now, Cornelius was not even a believer. But Cornelius used to pray. And Cornelius used to give to the poor. And, and the angel of the Lord came and he said, Your prayers and your giving have come up. Your prayers and your offering has come up as a memorial before God. Now, we've spoken about prayer, that prayer ascends as incense. But here he says, Your prayers and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. What is a memorial? A memorial is something that God never forgets. A memorial is something that God never forgets. So God never forgets prayer. And God never forgets an offering. Come and read it for us. Psalms 20 verses 1 through to 4. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the, Lord, of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you according to your heart desire and fulfill all your purpose. May he remember all your offerings. So he says, so God never forgets an offering. He has a record of it. Why? Because when you give, it doesn't just end in the bank account of your church. It doesn't just end, you know, by being enjoyed by those you've given to. It ascends to heaven as a sweet smelling aroma. God has a record of it. He never forgets it. He remembers it. It becomes a memorial. A memorial is something God never forgets. And so God comes to Cornelius and, and, and through the angel and he says, Your prayers and your offering has ascended to heaven as a memorial. So when you minister to the needs of others, when you give in church for the extension of the kingdom, whether you pay your tithe, whether you give, whether you be give in a church project, whether you give to the poor, any form of giving, whether in the church or outside of the church, God never forgets it. So that is why you, do, you should not use your money to spite the pastor. Use your money to punish the pastor. You are punishing yourself. God will always have a way of, of, of funding his work, but you will, be, you will deprive yourself of God's blessings. Whatever you do in obedience to God's word, you are doing it for yourself. It is for your own benefit. God never forgets your offering. Now, Proverbs 19 verse 17 
In the New Living Translation, the Bible says, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. If you lend to the poor, I'm sorry, if you give to the poor, you are lending to the Lord and the Lord will repay you. Look at the connection between giving to the poor and lending to the Lord. So when you see a poor family, when you see a poor person on the streets, they may be born again, they may not be born again, and you, you know, you are moved with generosity, and you give them money, you are lending to the Lord. Because God has a special place for the poor. So don't give religiously, thinking or giving it's only in church. Yes, it is in church, but outside of church too. That relative of yours that you are helping through school, that you are helping to finish university, you are doing good. That is a sacrifice. It is well-pleasing to the Lord. When you help your siblings, through, you put them through school and you help them because no one else can help them, it is an offering well-pleasing unto the Lord. When you take care of your parents because they can no longer take good care of themselves, you are giving, that is an act of worship to the Lord. One day I was helping some of my family members and the strain was too hard on me. And the Lord said this to me, he said, son, see this as a form of giving and you will get the harvest because if you see it as helping them, it will discourage you and break you. And ever since then, I see whenever a family member needs my help and I can help, I see it as an opportunity to sow a seed so that I will receive a harvest. If I cannot help, I tell them I can't. But if I can, I say, Lord, as I help them, I thank you that I'm sowing a seed and I will receive a harvest. That's why give us never lack. So when you give to the poor, any form of giving is a sacrifice. The Bible says when you give to the poor, you are lending to the Lord. That is why, Bazalwana, we should not neglect giving to global care we should not global care is our ngo remember part of our vision is to bridge is to create a bridge between the church and society and global care is an ngo that we use to touch the community it is an ngo that helps us to be relevant to the community in a practical way right now my wife and some you know five members they are in mozambique right now where we planted a church to go and encourage those people it's because of your giving there's a church in maputo right now there's a church in mashaila right now because of your giving you may not have been to mashaila but through your giving you have been there there are churches we are supporting them financially because of your faithful giving. Listen, just as you pay 10%, the church, the income of the church, we also set aside 10% for missions where we used to support ministers, churches. We've got a church in Zimbabwe. We support ministers on a monthly basis from Mozambique. The church in Mozambique now in Maputo is putting up a building right now. And we are teaching them to, to learn how to give so that God can bless them. And we said, listen, we will help you here and there. But the same God who is in South Africa is the same God in Mozambique. And what he can do for us as South African, he can do for you as Mozambican. So we will teach you, we will give you certain things, but believe God. And they have put a foundation right there. So when you give to GCM, we have put a building in Mozambique right now in Mashaile that sits 500 people. The building is there, not by faith, it's there. Let's not neglect the poor. You know what the Bible says will happen when we neglect the poor? A 
it says, <laughs> if we shut our ears to the cry of the poor, the Bible says, he who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor, will he himself cry and never be heard? One of the hindrances of prayer is shutting our ears to the cry of the poor. Let's not allow the storehouse of global care to dry up. Remember, when you give to GCM, we give to poor people in our community. We've got a white brother and a white sister, and they go to Libueng. Do you know where those people come from? They come from the streets in Kempton Park. You see, Brother Wiseman there, Wiseman, who is taking care of this place, where, the, where did the gospel find Brother Wiseman? In the streets in Kempton Park. Today he's a man of God, he fears God, he loves God, he's responsible. Why? What made the difference? You're giving. We're talking about giving for the expansion of the kingdom. Giving for the poor. Giving to the poor. Let me give you a last scripture on this one. You see, understand this about giving. Any, I need a pianist. Are you here? Any, any help or any good you do to your fellow men. Any good you do to your fellow men. You are doing it to the Lord. Any good. Look at Matthew 25 verses 35 through to 45. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and we take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did this to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. You see that? Assuredly I say to you, that's verse 40, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren you did it to me so he's saying anything that you do to show kindness visiting people in prison giving to the poor clothing the naked you are doing it to Jesus because you are demonstrating his heart of love you see people will never see Jesus physically but they want to see Jesus through the church they want to see his love through the church they want to feel his generosity through the church they want to feel his compassion through the church Jesus said as long as I'm in the world I'm the light of the world Jesus is no longer physically in the world so we are the light of the world we are his representative we are the salt and light we must represent him. We, we, we need to be the extension of his love. The gospel is not just in preaching verbally. It is also in preaching with our lifestyle. Study churches that are powerful. You will find that they have got a strong arm in missions. You will find that they give a lot to the poor. You will find that they are givers. Study believers who are operating from strong altars. Study intercessors that are strong, that are powerful. One of the character qualities that they have is that they are givers. You can never build a strong altar, personal altar, if you are stingy. It's not just about prayer. Prayer is only one of the sacrifices. It's not the only sac one of the sacrifices. Every time you see an opportunity to help someone, you must know you are doing it as unto the Lord. 
and sometimes you may be put on a test God may appear to you in the form of someone who has a need the Bible says be careful to entertain ang I mean strangers lest you entertain angels be very careful of the people you turn away. Be very careful of the people that need your help, that you turn away. Now I know there's a lot of con artists these days. There's a lot of scavengers and a lot of sorties. That's why you need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. There's a lot of people in town that will ask you for money and things like that. Others, they are reeking of alcohol. They want to go and drink. Others, they are just scams. Be very careful. But be sensitive to the Spirit of God. religiously you see people that are religious they think giving is only done in church of course we need to give in church to expand the work of God but any form of generosity is an act of worship so when we talk about building a strong altar giving giving to the poor giving in church giving to people you know giving to people you don't know because in Matthew 25 verse 40 he says what you do to the least of these you are doing it to me visiting prisons going in prisons to preach to prison inmates going to hospitals to pray for the sick whether they are born again or not born again it's not an issue Jesus says you are doing it to me so any act of kindness that you carry out to your fellow humanity you are doing it to the Lord it is an act of worship it's a sacrifice on the altar lastly the last sacrifice spiritual sacrifice this is not the last one we we'll have Two remaining ones we'll look at those next Sunday spiritual sacrifice number four thanksgiving praise and worship thanksgiving praise and worship these are sacrifices that we can offer unto the Lord upon the altar where we praise and worship we are offering spiritual sacrifices unto God Hebrews 13 15 by him therefore let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name so the scripture calls praise a spiritual sacrifice it causes a true offering that really reaches to God's heart this is a direct quotation from Hosea 14 verse 2 that makes it even clearer offer unto God the continual sacrifice of praise so praise thanksgiving praise and worship is a spiritual sacrifice you offer on the altar so you need to go into your altar you see many of you you wait to come to church to worship you don't worship at home you don't praise at home because there's no keyboard in your 
altar, in that room, in your altar where you connect with God. That's where you need to begin to praise. That's where you begin. You need to begin to thank God. Praise and thanksgiving and worship are spiritual sacrifices. And as you begin to praise God and worship God, you will have a strong personal altar. Because some, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that God indwells. He dwells in the praises of his people. Praise attracts the presence of God. Praise is a sacrifice that goes into the heavens and it provokes God to come down and rule in our affairs. So sometimes you just need to go to your altar and begin to praise him and begin to thank him. Father, I thank you. Father, thank you for for the life that you've given me thank you for your loving kindness thank you for your mercy thank you for your grace over my life thank you for your angelic your comprehensive daily 24 7 angelic surveillance and protection over my life thank you for your, your you know your your unfailing love your your unconditional love thank you for loving me thank you that while i was yet a sinner christ died for me thank you that you didn't wait for me to be a good christian to love me your word says while i was yet a sinner Christ died for me. Father, thank you for your provision. Thank you for the roof above my head, the clothing on my back and the food in my stomach. Thank you Father for protecting me. Thank you for my parents. Thank you for my siblings. Thank you for my pastor. Thank you for my church. Look at the good things you can thank God about. Thank you for my job. Lord, it may not be the best of jobs but at least I'm making an income. Thank you Father God for what's good. Thank you for the brethren. Thank you for my mentors. And Begin to thank God on the altar praise him worship him for thou O lord 